Not a matter of if, but when crisis will rock your world. I'm Rashini Rajkumar, crisis strategist, licensed attorney, and host of The Crisis Files. In each case file, we explore a real world crisis. If there were any two people who embody an extremely personal reaction to the unexpected, it's the pair in studio with me today. They join me for a special case file, our 100th episode of The Crisis Files. A big note of appreciation to all of our listeners for helping achieve this milestone. 2017, a pivotal year for both my guests. The year each, one by choice, one because she was not given a choice, had their left leg amputated. They are here for the case file I call Breaking Views. Each works as a television broadcaster in the Minneapolis-St. Paul market. We'll learn more about their work details as we chat. Happily, they were able to continue the work they love. But first, I ask each of you to bring us back to that pivotal year and your heart-wrenching decision. Chris? 2017, while I was lucky enough to meet Courtney, by the way, which I would say would be one of the bright lights that happened from all this, because to have somebody who is in your profession and somebody who's so nice and fun and to have us go oh, through this. stop, stop, stop. <laughs> to have us kind of have this crap happen at the same time in our lives, and I'll use that word because that's, <laughs> that's what it is. And this is we're a podcast. Yeah, you can right yeah, there. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, we can curse on podcasts, yes, right? Yes, you can. So in 2017, after what really is essentially a lifetime of problems with my left ankle, I was forced to make the decision to have my left foot amputated. It had been exacerbated because I'd had a revision surgery on an artificial ankle joint that summer, and the revision surgery did not work, and the joint became infected. What they don't tell you, or maybe they do in some very, 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 very small print, is that you can only get one artificial ankle. You can get two knees, you can get two hips, you can get multiple of different artificial joints, but when it comes to the ankle, they can only do it once because it's such a small part of your body. Wow. I took a shot on it. It was not working for me. It never really worked for me. They went in to do a revision surgery. It became infected. And the other thing they don't tell you is when you have an infection in an artificial joint, it has to come out. The whole joint has to come out. My choice- Which makes sense, but they you didn't really yeah, know that ahead of time. right. Then my option at that point was, but was not good. We fought the infection for a while, and it was very evident that it wasn't going anywhere. At one point, the lady took a metal probe and poked it down in right into my, and and was like hitting the. I know Ouch. it's disgusting. We're cringing here in studio. Was hitting the artificial joint, and they're like, "This has to come out." And so at that option, it was well, we can pull that out. We can put a block of something in there, like a plastic block in there. A space holder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> essentially a giant Lego brick, whatever it might be, close you up and then hope that your body will heal itself over a number of months. And when the infection is cleared, then we can go in and try to figure out what kind of foot we might come up with, which will be something we'll cobble together with cadaver bones. Oh my gosh, this and, does not sound savory at right, all. Like I don't at even what, know how you listen through what, all of this. At what point? Who in, is your doctor? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But at that point, it was very, very, very evident to me that after a life of 17, 18, 19 some odd surgeries, that it was time to let it go. Right. So when we say, Chris Eggert, that you had a choice and you made a choice, it was really after so much pain and so many surgeries, and it was almost like you had no choice. But Well, that, I mean, the infection forced us to have to do something more quickly. I mean, and you just heard me lay out the scenario for you there. Was that a choice? I don't I don't really think exactly. it was a choice. So it's all relative, right? All right. Courtney Godfrey, you had a very different story from Chris's. It was more of a sudden decision in your face. Yeah, both traumatic. Just Chris knew it was coming. I didn't know it was coming. So we were out on the lake like we are most weekends. My husband's driving the boat and he made a quick turn. I was sitting down. I was holding on. You know, we practice boat safety. My husband grew up on the lake. But, you know, it's a motorized vehicle. Anything can happen. And uh, I 
fell out of the boat. The boat turned right over me. The inboard propeller hit my foot, and the propeller sliced right through my heel, and there wasn't any foot left to save. So I was rushed to HCMC where the amazing doctors and nurses. Which is a Minneapolis downtown hospital. Yeah, Hennepin room. Healthcare. Yeah, they're the level one trauma center, the busiest emergency room in the state of Minnesota. And I was told that I'd be an amputee for the rest of my life. So that's how I ended up here was, you know, one day I was walking out of my condo for a beautiful day on the lake. And a week later, I was walking back in with one leg and a new life ahead of me. So it was truly not really a choice. You had to go with this prosthetic. There was no choice. Was my foot really was no gone. Choice. It was gone. I want to get into, though, both of you have amazing family support system. Courtney, in your case, this was such a tragic accident. But you've been able to go on past the pain, past the surgeries. And in your case, there was a foundation that reached out to you, some leaders at that foundation that really helped you get through it. And that, I would say, springboarded into your own activism for amputees in general. I would say within the first 24 hours, once the shock wore off that I was an amputee, I immediately took this position of, I'm not gonna sprout another foot, so I might as well make something positive out of this. That can be a hard position to take for a lot of people. I am naturally a positive person, so I chose to lead with joy and make something good out of this. You know, if this was the life I was going to lead, I was going to do something with it, and I was going to bring other people hope. My family, who was clearly shocked and in trauma, they were looking for anyone, anyone to turn to, and my sister was in California waiting for her flight to come to Minnesota, and she was on the internet looking up organizations because we didn't know any amputees. I had maybe met another amputee doing a story reporting for the news, but I didn't know anything about this life that I was just thrown into. I didn't know anything about prosthetics. So she got online. She found an organization based in Minnesota called Wiggle Your Toes. And within the first 48 hours, they were in our hospital room. They were working my husband through what our life was going to look like. They went to our condo and they outfitted it to get it ready for me to come home. Yeah, that really springboarded me into a life of advocacy and amputee activism, advocacy, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Chris, through, you know, obviously different ways you two got to where you are. I thought it was an interesting coincidence for both of you. It's your left side. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us, because I'm I had to double check, by the way, when you said that. <laughs> I had to look down and went, oh, yeah. It is her left one. But I'm curious. We're like clinging legs over here, Yeah, by I, the way. I love it. And you were comparing feet before, yes, which we I want to ask yes, you about. We what does it feel like? The like, can... Does the feeling stop at your knee? And excuse my ignorance, but yeah. I, I'm thinking our listeners are wondering too. And I think Courtney and I have a little bit different experience with this because do you have phantom pain? No, no. I have phantom pain. What is that? And it's a real thing. In fact, you and your husband, when one of the first people to stop and visit us, Courtney brought, and I won't get too deep into this, but she brought a mirror over because there's a therapy that you can do to Basically, you lay it down next to your sound leg, and it gives the illusion that both of your legs are there when you're looking down at it. It tricks your brain into thinking that your foot's still there. Yes. So it trains your brain to stop firing into that left foot to wake up the left foot. For me, it worked. I don't get a ton of phantom pain. Yeah. I do get some. Yeah. But, yeah, Chris gets it a lot worse than I do. So basically, I get the feeling and sensation that not only is my foot there, but it hurts. It, it ebbs and flows in times, and this is going to sound insane too, but you know when like old people, by the way, I'm one of them, when old people are like, my joints hurt, ah, there must be a storm coming, ah, I get that. I know when there's a change in barometric pressure, a storm coming, that's when my phantom pain kicks up more. And basically, I will toss and turn throughout the night with this pain. It's not just the sensation that my foot is there. It's pain in the foot. And a lot of times, it feels like it's radiating from my big toe, which again— Of your prosthetic foot. Isn't there, right. And you or don't, you'll, you'll get an itch that you can't the scratch. The itch is bad. Like, I have—I'll get an itch on my left foot. I don't have a left foot, but I am confident that my left foot— And you know, still itches. itch? Some well, there's people, nothing to itch, right? <laughs> no, there's I know. Nothing to itch. Well, I mean, you're a part of your— So some people say reach down and, like, scratch— 
where I've your foot would be. One. I'm, I'm you should try, try it. <laughs> the things you learn on the crisis yeah. files, Chris. Yeah, I had no idea. And then at night, or do you always take it off? Have to. Have to take it off. So I'm not trying to sound like a complainer. Like, and I don't think you'll get too many complaints from either of us here. We, we're dealing with this, this situation with as much grace as we can. These things are not comfortable. And so I don't know one means to be insulting with it when they say it, but everyone's like first thing they fall back on when they meet you. And they're like, well, gosh, the technology's really changed a lot over the years. And I hear it's a much better experience, which I'm sure it is for us than it was. Sure, I mean, you've seen back it. in 1895. Well, you, you can see- Even in 1995. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Afghanistan and the Iraq war forced the Department of Defense to invest a lot of money in prosthetic technology really? because so, yeah. many, so many men and women were coming yep. back from the Middle from East. The IEDs. Yes, without legs. So God bless them for so many reasons, but they have made our lives a little better. But yeah, I mean, listen, is it like a real foot? No. Heck no. It doesn't feel good. Right. It's like the most uncomfortable pair of shoes you own and then wearing them to walk all everywhere. the time. That's the way it feels to me. Like a good pair of leather shoes that you only wear for church on Sundays and special, not even so, on every Sunday, like special occasion <laughs> Sundays. And you put those on with no socks and then put them on for 18 hours a day. That's that's about the level wow, of comfort. Wow, that really explains. So let's turn to the positive side. And I wasn't trying to be <laughs> I mean, negative. No, no, no. I, I, it is okay. I told again, you not to invite him. Again, I, I'm keeping it real. <laughs> again, I want the real because if we can through your stories and your words today, help more people understand and be less ignorant when they see someone who is living with a prosthetic, who is an amputee, I think we have done our job well. So on the really bright side, what I love is that you are both active people. My goodness, you're active, you know, parents, spouses, you work. Chris, you work at KSTP TV in St. Paul, Minnesota. Courtney, you work at Fox 9 TV in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. You're active, you're out doing stories, Courtney. Chris, you're anchoring the news very early in the morning and then co hosting a one hour long magazine show. I mean, there's a lot of sitting, there's a lot of moving, but then in your personal lives, you're also very active. So, Courtney, I think what might surprise a lot of our listeners is that. You also are a World Cup para snowboarder. You are a competitive snowboarder. And I would think that is almost the most opposite thing anyone would imagine an amputee can do. Yeah, and I do it, and I love it. I snowboarded before I lost my leg. I can honestly say I'm a better snowboarder today just because of the coaching and the training But I wanted to get back into snowboarding. We have a friend here who's on the Paralympic snowboard team, Mike Schultz. He actually took me out and got me back on my snowboard four months after my amputation. And after that, through my advocacy, I met a lot of people who were on the U.S. team. And they saw me snowboard. And a couple years ago when it was the Paralympic year for China, they said, we think you can make the team come out. And I said, I've never even seen a border cross course before. I've never seen a bank slalom course before. I had never raced before. I just was a casual snowboarder. Uh, that, that just sounds so like yeah, right. oxymoronic to me, but all right. <laughs> just a casual snowboarder. <laughs> just a casual snowboarder. <laughs> so now, yeah, I compete. And listen, is it as easy as it was with two legs? Of course not. You know, there's pains associated with the socket and just the way that you have to move and the pressure points. But I love it. And it gives me joy and it gives me something also that I can do for myself. You know, I'm a mom. I work full time. I do a lot of advocacy and none of that really is for me. So this is something that is mine that I do for me. And in the process, I get to show other amputees that yes, you can. You can get out there and do hard things. You can get out there and do action sports. And I can show my kids that mommy went through something terrible, but here she is tackling this amazing, incredible, crazy feat. And it is important to note, we didn't say this previously, you became a mom after you became an amputee. Also not easy. I have carried two babies My prosthetic, Chris's prosthetic, our prosthetics are made very specifically for the way that your body is right now. So when I gain 35 pounds and I'm putting 35 extra pounds into a socket, by the end of my pregnancy, I can't even wear my leg. So, and I'm unable to be active by the end of my pregnancy because I, the pressure points are so painful. But the reward, obviously, in the end, Cal and Frankie are the biggest blessings, and uh, I would do it again. So, 
it is what it is. Uh, and I also am able to show other female amputees. I hear from a lot of female amputees who they lose their leg and they are so worried about dating, about childbearing. And I'm able to show them that, yes, you can. It's going to take some work with your prosthetist. You might be immobile for part of your pregnancy, but yes, you can. I love that. Yes, you can. Chris, what is that happy place for you ever since the events of 2017? Well, I would add, I am a 50-year-old man, and I have no (laughs) business going down a snowy hill on a snowboard. Wiggle Your Toes, we're both very involved in, and um, they're like, you should do the ski clinic. And I'm like, nope, I'm not skiing. (laughs) I'm 50. I should not be going down the hill anyway. But I feel the same way about running. Yeah, well. You know, I I have no desire to run. Everybody's like, get a running blade. Yeah. I'm good. I will run from time to time just because of everything else. I My other knee on my sound leg is terrible because for 30 years it carried a lot of the weight because my foot was bad. So I so know I need, knee, knee I know I need a knee replacement, <laughs> oh which I'm not going to do, by the way. Um, and so Trauma. I was a basketball player, and that's how I – kind of basically got to the position I'm in. I was a college basketball player, not, you know, not a super high level, but it's important for me to try to be able to do things. I wanted to be able to play basketball with my kids in the driveway. I wanted to be able to play catch football with my son. My son's at St. Thomas. He's an old lineman for St. Thomas. He's playing football. My daughter aspires to play college basketball, which I think she will if she decides to go that route. It was very important for me to be active enough when they were growing up that I could be involved and to help to teach them and to coach them. I'm not going to be trying to be a Paralympian. That, we that was we sort just of, all can't do that. that was sort of, I mean, we right. just have to accept that. That was sort of my goal because I look back over the kids is growing up. I think my son's 19. He's going to be 19 in a couple of weeks. A majority of the pictures I had with them when they were little, I was on crutches. I was wow. having surgery every year or two and at some point, it all kind of happened. And again, like my hand was forced. I didn't really want to do it in 2017. But at that point, I was like, I would like these kids to not know crutch dad. Like, right. And, well, that's very real. I think yeah. a lot of people out there can relate to that, wanting your children, your nieces and nephews to really see you as a healthy, able-bodied adult. Yeah. So that is really a benefit of the choice you had to make, right? Let's talk a little bit about how you now are out there advocating for other amputees, and also those of us who aren't, helping us understand the world through a different lens. What has been, I guess, what are some of the big highlights of that work? I think that simply even just being on Instagram and being out there and being someone who looks physically different, being on TV. I mean, Rashini, and I don't know if you were going to go there anyway, but we work in a visual median where People see it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And You're both on TV every day. And like it or not, when we get hired, what we look like is a big part of why we have our jobs. Think of TV news. Everybody you see on the TV news is visually appealing because we're Very easy on the eye. in this case. But. Well, oh, Chris. we're easy on the eye. It's not distracting. I can think of one TV reporter in my lifetime that I know that was physically disabled, a WCCO reporter. In Minneapolis. Years ago. Many years ago. And mm-hmm. she was wonderful. And she was one of the best reporters in town and good on WCCO for hiring her. But unfortunately, you don't see people with physical disabilities on TV often enough. And then when you're a kid sitting at home thinking, I'm a freak because I look different, how powerful for them to see someone with that platform also looking different. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really normalizing that all different shapes, sizes, bodies, physical abilities are absolutely able to do anything. Wiggle Your Toes is an organization that Courtney's involved in. I'm involved too. By the way, Aaron hit me up to be on the board of directors. I know. I just texted him. More. I texted him before this. That. I said, am I allowed to say something or have you talked to him yet? Which I'll probably do because it's a fantastic Pro- I'm organization. I'm going to say yes. You're going to say, say yes. My right hang-up has been in the past. I've got kids, as I mentioned, in a certain age and He's coaching. Well, Chris, that's, that's they right. don't need you as much for sure. And now that I've got a 16 year old who drives, I, dude, I'm sitting around the house for nine hours a day, like just waiting for someone to come home. So oh, I've right. got, I've okay. got, I don't believe that either. I've got but. the time. 
what I like about Wiggle, it's an empowerment organization. Unfortunately, you've got to deal with this situation, but what are you going to do with that? And then how are you going to make your life better? And the idea that you can run again, the idea that they'll build a special foot for a little boy so he can ride motorcycle, the idea that they will help to give you a path to water ski, to uh, what, what's that thing you call again? Going Snowboarding. Down? Snowboard. Like, see, I'm old. <laughs> Whatever it might be. Like, that's why I like them in particular, because the message is not sitting back and dealing with it. It's owning it and, and making yourself. And right. So no matter where our listeners live, there is probably something like a wiggle your toes in different parts well, of the U.S. we're a national organization. You're national. Yeah. Excellent. We help. It's based Excellent. in Minnesota, but we help amputees Excellent. all over the country. Well, we'll make sure that their web link is For part sure. of this episode. I love these stories. So I'm going to wind down with something very personal. I have not prepped this question with either Chris or Courtney. You have the opportunity. I'm sure your your spouses are going to listen to this. What would you each like to say to them? Wow. Thank you. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for lifting me up. Thank you for still seeing me as beautiful despite my physical disabilities. Um, thank you for being an amazing supportive husband and father. Nothing has changed for him. And, you know, he had to work through a lot of guilt himself because he was driving the boat that day. Um, but for me, with him, it is thank you because I couldn't have asked for a more supportive spouse. Chris? <laughs> uh, You're on the yeah, spot. I, I, my, my wife has put up with so much, whether it's the hours I've been working for the last 20 years, which, by the way, is get up at 2 in the morning and— it's not been an ideal setup at all. And then to have this sort of happen, which she embraced with positivity and grace, and she's a very religious person. And, you know, she used this opportunity as a, a God prompting or, you know, whatever phrase she used at the time. But she's been a superstar throughout all of it. And I get approached, as I know Courtney does, from people all the time who find themselves in this situation. And they're like, well, talk to me about what it's like. And I will always try to get, if they're married, I will always try to get their significant other in on the conversation too, because that person has to deal with just about as much, if not more, than the person who's losing a limb, because it changes their lives in all kinds of different ways too. So it and being a caretaker is not yeah. easy. No, not. And, and you're in pain. And that's and an interesting term because I think we think of, oh, I'll need a caretaker one day when I'm 80 or 90, not when I'm in the prime of my life, working, thriving, being a parent. So that's really special that you use that term with us today, Courtney. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. No. And I think even today when we have a baby who wakes up in the middle of the night, guess who's going to go get her? Not the person with one leg. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, can I just say an another uh, like, and you're not saying it. I'll be more <laughs> oh, great. direct. So you can't just get up and put this thing on. It doesn't just go on. It's not it like just, slipping it's not on. Like a, a, it's not like slipping on. You can add Lego. Right. <laughs> right. Not a quick Velcro so action. So when she, the baby's crying in the other room and she's got to get up and go run in there and try. Well, first of all, not run. Either try to put on. <laughs> So Gosh, I'm, Chris, I don't run. How rude. She never so runs. I didn't mean that. How rude. <laughs> leg or no leg. But so the idea that you just I hop. get up and spring into the other room and be able to, like, it doesn't work that way. And if you put your leg on or if you've got some sort of assist device that a lot of people do to help them at night just to, like, quickly go to the bathroom or whatever. But I'm thinking about how annoying it is to me, like, having to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which, by the way, you do have to do a billion times when you get to be at a certain age. Like, I'm thinking about you having to get up in the middle of the night a billion different times with the kids, and I'm like, oh, my God, that sounds awful. But at the same time in the morning, my kids, my big thing as a parent that I was so worried about becoming a mom was that my children would be teased because their mom looks different. Because mm. unfortunately, the human brain yeah. sees a physical difference and it doesn't really like it. So, and especially children, they're, they have no filters. They're still learning. My fear was that my kids would be teased for the way that I look. And it's been amazing to watch the development. My son is four and a half. My daughter's much younger, so she's not there yet. But I remember one of the first times I picked him up from preschool when it was shorts weather. And 
quite honestly, I often wear pants for pickup because I just want to avoid putting him in that situation. But I was wearing shorts and all the kids gathered around. What is that? That's what's going on there. What is what is your foot? What kind is of that? adorable. And I started to launch into the conversation that Chris and I have probably had a hundred times with kids because kids always ask. And my son jumped in and said, that's my mommy's metal foot because she fell off a boat and the doctor gave her a new one. And he said it so confidently (laughs) and not only confidently, but he said it with pride. And that was when I knew my kids were going to be okay. And that was really a beautiful moment for me. But they also come into my room in the morning and even the one and a half year old hands me the prosthetic leg like, come on. Get out of bed, you lazy bum. You know, hands me the like, hands me the liner that I have to put on before I put on the prosthetic. So it's very important to me to raise them in an open, loving household, no matter what you look like, no matter what kind of mobility device you use. And it's an important conversation to have with people. And I try and spread this message on Instagram and Facebook as much as I can. But any parent out there, Teach your kids that people come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms, and that that's okay. You know, that we use different mobility devices to get around. When your kid sees somebody in the grocery store who's in a wheelchair and they have questions, talk to them about it. But don't stigmatize it. Say, oh, that's how they get around. They're going to the store just like us. Exactly. In terms of the positive versus they can't do something. That's just how they get around. Mm -hmm. We get around on our two feet. They get around on their wheels. Right. I love it. Well, wow. We have gone through the range of emotions in this conversation. I don't think I've ever laughed as hard on an episode. So thank you for celebrating the 100th episode with us. Congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Courtney Godfrey, Chris Eggert, you are both amazing. Thanks for your candor and courage. You can find and follow both of them on Instagram at Courtney M. Godfrey and at Chris Eggert TV. Today's Crisis Brief is brought to you by Huntington. Number one, life happens. How you react is what matters most. Number two, you are never an island reach out to someone who can relate. Check out wiggleyourtoes.org. Number three, when you see someone who is different from you, pause and reframe how you look at them. Sometimes reaching your goals takes more than money. It takes know-how. That's why money's just the start of what Huntington can do. Get more than money from your bank. See how at huntington.com slash get more. Help spread the word about The Crisis Files. Like us, review us, and subscribe to The Crisis Files on your platform of choice. Check out thecrisisfiles.com website to catch up on all case files in one spot. Follow us on YouTube and Instagram at The Crisis Files. I'm Roshini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files. 